That nickel, nickel nine. Yeah. Uh, five nine J. Uh, uh, let me speak my mind up. Uh, uh, it's just me keeping it real. Uh huh. Keeping it one hundred. Let's go. Yeah. Hey yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed, and like I always say, it's one live, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. That being said, man, I did a YouTube short the other day. It was a small article. It was an article published in Los Angeles Times, and I didn't want to get hit with no copyright infringement. And you know, I've had interactions with that uh reporter. So some of his content, he dude, he's heavily involved in stories and how he looks up cases when it comes to Mexican mafia hits and Mexican mafia stories and crimes of Southern California. And I'm fascinated with that man's work. I wish I could do investigative journalism like him. So sometimes I do utilize this content and create a message and paraphrase and you know, provide my own reviews and criticisms on it. This one right here, I didn't really want to do per se because of the picture. I know it's a copyrighted thing. So what happened was, is I posted this on a YouTube short, a quick little glimpse of a Mexican mafia hit that took place in the city of Los Angeles, right? And I didn't think much of it. I didn't think to do a background check on the suspect that's being accused that recently pled not guilty to the murder. But like I said, my subscribers, shout out to my subscribers. They do their due diligence and hook me up with some content to talk about for you guys. So I appreciate all the love and support and people that want to keep me posted and keep me relevant on YouTube. So let's get into the video. Negro. For Maticia Trece, it was a Mexican Mafia member, went to the federal penal system. If you read the Los Angeles Times article, it talks about, you know, his love life, his marriage, and what he did to go to prison, and his political ties to the Mexican Mafia, right? But we all know the story of Negro, his fallout within the Mexican Mafia. He slapped an older Mexican Mafia member. Mexican Mafia member right here who... Ruben Soto, we're going to be doing a story on very shortly. I'm just doing a lot of background and research and gathering all the notes that I need. But I guess he slapped him in the face. And, you know, it's crazy is that in the rule is in the Mexican Mafia, carnal is never to put hands on another carnal. But if you really think about it, good standings or not, blasting another carnal is putting hands on another carnal. Just because you guys all agreed to some irregular circumstance that this man should be deemed no good and he should be placed on disregard or we should take his power he doesn't belong into the organization anymore you're still putting hands on another karna there's no other way around it if you made a rule saying that you can't put hands on one another but yet you're quick to stab each other just to take over power take over yards and take over streets you're breaking your cardinal rule every time you raise your hand to blast another brother that's the hypocrisy about brotherhood they share so much ideology in essence of let's protect each other. You're my brother. You can call a man a brother a hundred times a year, but you'll find a reason to kill your brother at the end. And that's what they do to each other. So, you know, him, he was on the yard with Weddle Sherman. Weddle Sherman was in the ad seg and they had their own little disputes. But you know, I guess it was a cardinal sin that he slapped another Mexican mafia member in the face. A highly ranked and highly respected Mexican mafia member in accordance to their history and you know what the organization stands for he was like one of the few founders the one of the godfathers so he gets placed on a green light and he actually makes it home the fortunate the unfortunate circumstance about this story is this you know dude's been a powerful person for a very long time for years in the penal system being a drug addict which most mexican mafia members are saying most not all but being a drug addict all those years, having access to all the amount of dope that you wanted, that's what you live for in prison for 12 years in your political stance within your organization. So he comes home abandoned by his organization. So what does he really have? Because it's, it's, you know, it's not often you're going to hear about Mexican mafia members paroling and they're $100,000 rich and they can do whatever they want. Most men that parole from the penal system parole with them $200 gate money, the clothes on their back, maybe a family, maybe not a family. He's a, he was an older gentleman, so reality, was what was he really coming home to? Who was still alive in his lifetime and his family that was part of his family that he could turn to? I don't know the circumstances how this man paroled after having a wife and you know having so many people look out for him while he was in the penal system. But everybody looked out for him on the basis that he was a Mexican mafia member and people had to answer to him. But now that his own people deemed him no good, don't nobody got to look out for him. So he comes home to nothing. One of the most harshest realities that you can possibly 
deal with as a parolee, whether you're an active gang member, an SNY gang member, a Mexican mafia member, an NF member, just a regular gang member. Coming home to nothing is one of the harshest realities, man. It's one of the most rudest awakenings you could ever possibly imagine. That you did everything for everybody, but nobody was there for you in the end. You do stuff for your neighborhood, and your neighborhood just grew. Everybody moved on in life. There's new members that don't even know who you really are. That can care less about you. Care that you're from the hood. Dude came home to nothing. Ended up being homeless at a 10. I think he got gunned down like right behind Jordan High School or something like that. And... He's living in a tent. But to me, no, there's no difference. You know, living in a tent, living in a cell, it's still harsh conditions, harsh circumstances that will make it unbearable if you let it get to you in your head. So the thing about living in a cell is you don't pay rent. You get three meals a day and you get clothes on your back. You get food, you get water, you get toilet. I mean, you can go to yard, you get your exercise. A lot of perks for a lot of people that just want to, be repeated violent offenders and just be bums and just go live in jail like the rest of us. But he was living in a tent. And I don't know what it's like to be really homeless. I did it for a little bit, but I bounced back. But there's people that go for years on in survival mode. And reality, he came out of prison and just chased the dragon. He was addicted to drugs. He was strung out on heroin. And I mean, like I said, he was a drug addict most of his life. That's what he liked to do. That's what he indulged in. So, of course, coming home and having access to far more amounts of dope at a cheaper price, of course, man, he just fed into his habit. And if he caused himself to be in those conditions of being homeless and living in a tent, then he did it to himself. But I guess he was recognized by this man, this man that you see right here across the screen. Recognized as being Negro from Matisse Atrece. Recognized that he was actually living in this homeless camp, this encampment of homeless people, and he was living in a tent. How he was able to identify that and find the man's location is beyond me. It wasn't described in the Los Angeles Times article. And the thing about this rapper, the thing about this man that took matters into his own hands to kill the next Mexican mafia dropout was that he was actually signed as a rapper. He was signed to Swifty Blue's record label. And this is the video that I'm showing you guys, him in the studio with Swifty Blue. Swifty Blue is the one recording it. And he's sign and he's dropping one of his songs he has a couple of songs with 50 blue he has a couple of songs by himself that i'm posting across the screen i listen to his music now in no way shape or form am i decharacterizing swifty blue's reputation because in reality i'm not saying swifty blue connected to this rapper could be a connection to this mexican mafia hit that went down i am not saying that so i want to make that abundantly clear in this video but there's a couple aspects that i do want to point out right first and foremost I'll say it, admit it, I'm not, it doesn't make me less of a man. I'm a big fan of Swifty Blues music. I think he's one of the harder rappers out of Southern California. That is just my personal opinion. Yes, I get it. Lefty Gunplay has motion. Lefty Gunplay does get the views, does get the audience, does get the streams. Looks like a millionaire throughout social media. And he's the most talked about Sudanio rapper when it comes to the Southern game. Southern rap game, should I say. But to me, Swifty, I think, outbeats him lyrically. I don't know how that he was able to supersede Swifty Blue. Because when I first came out of prison, I didn't hear about Lefty. I didn't hear, I didn't really listen to King Lil G. I didn't hear about no other rapper other than Swifty Blue. Whether it's for his antics, whether it's for his personality, what the drama he got into, all I knew for a whole year was about Swifty Blue. Listening to his music, seeing his visuals, seeing his hustle, and believe it or not, I follow him on TikTok, I follow him on Instagram, I watch everything on YouTube about him. Because like I said, you know, his limelight when it comes to the rap game is something that I've been trying to chase for years. I think he's a better rapper than King Lil G. I think he's a better rapper than most Southern rappers that are out there. How he managed to get behind a couple of these rappers and the views get low, I still think he's better than Chito Ranas, but that's just my personal opinion. What I've seen here was, you know, there's a lot of limelight that goes on, a lot of speculation. I've done videos about Swifty. There's so many scenarios, but when it comes to this one, you know, I'm not going to sit here and point out that he had any ties to this man's agenda and why this man decided to go kill a Mexican mafia member in a homeless tent. I didn't even know if Swifty Blue had her his own record label at the time, but, you know, that was just news to me when I watched this video. But I listened to the songs. They're okay songs. Not my preference per se, but overall, the thing is, when I seen the whole thing that happened with Criminal and Diablo... Diablo and that's that paperwork, whether it's true or not, I still read the paperwork that people you know published across the screen. 
And you got to think about it. You know, you got rappers like King Lil G, you know, Swifty Blue, Drummer Boy, Lefty Gunplay, that are going to surround themselves with people from the street life, from people from their neighborhood. Boxers from Eastside Paramount. So I can see why he had political ties and connections and networked with Swifty Blue to elevate your game. In the same sense, Criminal brought Diablo up from banning and Diablo became, you know, millions of views rapper. And every you drop a video right now on YouTube talking about Diablo from banning, no matter if it was just a personal story or how you met him, it's going to get the views. People were intrigued of his gangsterism, his lyricism, the fact that he was in the rap game, the fact that he's been to prison most of the time, a lot of his life. People knew the man for who he really was besides just being a Southern rapper. So I'm pretty sure this dude Boxer had the same intentions, elevating himself to the rap game, connected to a rapper that was trending real bad back in the day, like good, that was trending real good, had the numbers, had the views, had the network, had the influence, pretty much had the attention of everybody. But in the same sense, you've seen how Diablo got criminal wrapped up in this little murder investigation. I don't know if those statements are true. I didn't. I had no opinion on it. Didn't never share my opinion on it. Don't know if the paperwork's real or not. Don't care about Mr. Criminal's response to all of it. You know, I just paid attention to watch and just kept it moving. But in the same essence, you got Diablo sitting in a cell that was involved in the gang life that got signed by Mr. Criminal, one of the hottest Sudanese rappers for like over 10 years. And then comes over here being accusatory on YouTube talking about, hey man, this fool told on me. And Criminal... Mr. Criminal, whether he did or he didn't, it's none of my business. But sometimes you're going to be placing yourself in these predicaments as entertainers, as record label owners, as Southern rappers that have these kind of record label connects. You could be forfeiting a lot of your opportunities and burning bridges by the people that you do associate yourself with in the first place. It just works like that. We've seen it with the Diablo and Criminal case. So in this case right here, it wasn't brought up in the Los Angeles Times. I was the one that put the two dots together along with subscribers that Swifty Blue had ties to the man that actually took out a Mexican Mafia dropout. I don't know if that's going to elevate his reputation. I doubt he'll bank on the reputation. But I do know he reposted my video. I'm not saying there's a connection between me and him whatsoever. My video made it came up on his For You page. And he reposted it saying, man, free the homie, free boxer. Obviously, from the homie's point of view, he's going to look at it like free the homie, guilty. I mean, innocent until proven guilty, or he probably not guilty. They probably railroaded him. But here's the thing when it comes to crimes. Yeah, there's been a lot of cases where, you know, the innocent was wrongfully accused. I think it's more rare than we think. But if they were able to connect this man to killing a Mexican mafia member, I'm pretty sure they have a strong case. Unless he has a strong alibi and a lot of people come forward and you know help him beat the case, then so be it. I'm not saying the man's guilty of it. I'm saying that's what he's being accused of. The allegations that are against him in which he pleaded not guilty to the other day. But I do want to say this. Two things. Dude, You, if you're connected to a rapper that can really help your situation out, give you opportunities that a lot of people on the streets are striving for every day, don't F that up. Just believe in that the street politics and the gang ties and the prison sense are more important than what you can do for yourself. I wouldn't do that whatsoever. If I knew it back then, I could have rapped with Woody and Big Tone and these only rappers and been a music rapper. Do you think I'd really be in the streets packing a pistol, trying to kill a Southerner or being destined to the Pinta? No, I'd have been trying to make a rap name just like these guys because 10, 20 years later, these guys are still living off residuals. Why forfeit an opportunity like that when somebody like Swifty Blue who was hot back then, still is trending now. Don't forfeit that opportunity because, you know, you can't abandon the gang mentality and the street politics just for a little bit. Why do that? Same thing with uh, Diablo from Banning. I mean, you got millions of views on YouTube. Now, was a, that was a time, the perfect time to bank on it. Yeah, I know the circumstances when it came to the family. You know, some people are going to be pulled out of their comfort zone and overreact. All I'm saying is don't get yourself involved with something that's going to take away every opportunity that you can create for yourself because other people either don't want you to win or they're obligating you to a street life because you obligated yourself to a street life and to a gang. And this is just my assumption in accordance to the allegation. This is it. This is an assumption. If, in fact, he did what he did, what he's being accused of and what he's pleaded not guilty to, what was your purpose and reasoning 
to carry out an order on behalf of Mexican Mafia members either you were in contact with or you weren't in contact with, you just knew and you were aware because most murders take place because they overheard it. Oh, I heard he's no good, fool. If he's no good, you sure you said that? You can vouch for that? You can vouch for that? Well, I trust you guys, but I'm going to gun this dude down. Mexican Mafia members are supposed to be killing their own if they drop out. And if members are supposed to be killing their own if they drop out. It's nobody else's business. But the Mexican Mafia has a strong voice and can be highly influential in dropping subliminals or ensuring that if they can't do it, I'm pretty sure there's a young Sudanian that wants to make his bones. They'll do it. Or a Southern rapper. He'll do it. They know better. Because even though I'm not telling them that they have to, they know that they have to. But if they don't do it and I find out about it, then I'm going to hold them accountable for it. But I never told them to do it in the first place. And yet it's a cardinal rule. It's part of our rules that we take care of our own. But if he don't take care of it and he knew better, I'll make sure he gets handled when he goes to the penal system. So it puts a lot of people in a conflicting bind. Like, hey, should I do it or should I not do it? I know he's there. And if they know that I know he's there and I didn't do nothing, they're going to kill me. So I might as well kill this dude anyways. You took the life. I'm just saying under assumption, allegedly, you took the life of somebody who's pretty much taking their own life and are dying slowly. The man went from being a highly regarded Mexican mafia member and a drug addict to just being a homeless man, deemed no good, a dropout and a drug addict living in a tent. Dude, you wasted your life away and you're looking at some serious charges, whether you get a deal, whether you get found guilty. You're looking at some serious charges for a man who didn't even take his own life serious, who, you know, found love with the spoon, found love with the syringe, found love with, you know, just his circumstances. He didn't care to make his life better. He was living in a homeless tent for a very long time. Drugs was all that really mattered to him. Not life, not women, not his kids, not a girlfriend, not bettering himself. Just chasing his drug addiction, which is hard to deal with. It's hard to combat. So I don't know if he was doing that or he just didn't really care. But 20-something years in the penal system just chasing drugs and using drugs and coming home and getting more drugs at a cheaper price, I doubt you're really going to try to beat your drug addiction and recover from it. But the man really was at the bottom, the bottom of his life, just hit rock bottom. A life like that, even if he was trying to change or he wasn't, it's not worth you throwing your life away on behalf of other people when the man didn't have no value for his own life in the first place. The least you could do is value your life and say, bro, that is not, is not even worth it. That would be just a waste of time. That murder is going to be worthless. It's going to be for nothing. What does it really matter? I'm killing a man that's eventually going to kill himself on his own regard and for, in his own circumstance with his own ability to take his own life, whether it's gradually and slowly whether it's through an overdose, the man's killing himself every day. How is that murder even worth it? And how is it even going to be worth it to men that weren't really going out their way to look for the man in the first place? They just happened to find him in a homeless tent, locate him, and, re and realize, oh, bro, that's a aim at dropout, bro. He used to be a carna. Oh, if I smoke this for him, I might get recognized. I might get some bones. I might be placed for membership because he's a well-known name. You don't, there, there's no guarantees for that. So... You could have became a Southern rapper, a trending rapper, millions of views, did some shows, slept with a lot of beautiful groupies. But instead, you're in L.A. County Jail sharing a bunk with another man, just following rules and following a program that's just going to keep you incarcerated and keep you in that same mind frame that you're going to be doing for others and not for yourself when you could have been out here doing for yourself and not for others. To me personally, guilty or not guilty, Killing the man that's already killing himself every day was not a noble act, an honorable act. It was just a waste of life, a waste of energy. And now the man's possibly looking at life at the possibility of parole when he could have been a successful rapper like Swifty or Lil King Lil G or anybody else. For what? For a man that was in a homeless tent being strung out on dope? I hope that dude is in the jail cell really asking himself, bro, was it really worth it? Like, what do I intend to gain from this? What do I intend to accomplish this? Because I just throw away my chances at different accomplishments, positive accomplishments, just a little tough in county jail right now. So that is the message for this video. So with that being said, like I always say, is one life, one chance. When we got one chance to do this right, let's get it done. Peace.